Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for joining the Southwest Center for Human Relations Studies here at the University of Oklahoma in Norman. For our monthly webinar series, I am Dr. Jenny Rungo. I'm the Executive Director of the Center and the Director of ENCO, and I'm very delighted to be your host today. For those of you joining us for the first time, ENCO offers two webinars per month on the first and on the last Wednesday of each month. Our next webinar, Using Autoethnography to Develop Race Cognizance in White Folks on Campus, will be presented on March 31st, 2021. Please visit our website, anchor.ou.edu for the full list of webinars on demand and upcoming webinars for this season. Where are you joining us from? Drop your institution, your location in the chat box. Let us say hello to each other that way. Also, you can tweet, you can Instagram, you can share with the hashtag Anchor Webinars, start the conversation online. All of our presenters today are doctoral students and research associates from the University of Southern California School of Education. We want to welcome Isaiah Simeons, Sarah Tautant, James Bridgeforth, Jamon Ortega, and least, but last but not least, Kaylan Baxter. Their topic today is accepted to assimilate implications for racial mismatch between education, PhD students, and their faculty. What an exciting topic today. I bet you all PhD students are joining us. The center is very, very grateful for their expertise. Please post questions in the Q&A box and they will address them at the end of this presentation. And just a reminder that closed captioning and ASL are available for this broadcast. So join me in welcoming our team. Welcome team. All right, we'll go ahead and get started um, and briefly introduce ourselves, starting with Kaylin. Hey everybody, my name is Kaylin Baxter. I'm a third year PhD student at the University of Southern California. Super excited to be here with you all. Hi everybody, I'm James Bridgeforth. I am a uh, second year PhD student at the University of Southern California and likewise excited to be here. What's going on everybody? My name is Jamin Ortega, also a second year PhD student at USC. Thank you all for coming and looking forward to our conversation today. Good afternoon, my name is Isaiah Simmons. I am also a second year student at the University of Southern California and I'm looking forward to our time together today. And hi everybody, again, my name is Sarah Tutant. I am a, P a third year PhD candidate at the University of Southern California. So it's obviously very important that we recognize the land that we are occupying today. All of us are not originally from Los Angeles, California. However, we have either moved here or um, live close by, but all of us do live in Los Angeles now um, to attend USC. That being said, the land on which we inhibit is physically situated in the original ancestral homelands of the Gabrieliano, Tongva, and Keats tribes. And we pay respect to all of those people, past, present, and future, and their continuing presence in the homeland and throughout their historical diaspora. So first, we already kind of got to hear where you all are joining us today from, but we wanna know a little bit more about your positions. I know there might be students here. There also might be PhD students, there might be faculty. So if you could utilize the chat box to share where you're joining from and your, your position. So I wanted to begin our time together by uh, sharing an image. And we wanted to begin with the image of this campus. It is a deserted campus. It is also our campus at the University of Southern California. And images of deserted campuses like this one here have been commonplace over the last 12 months. Uh, due to COVID-19 closures, we've all had to learn to work and live differently, which has been stressful to say the very least as we're approaching the one year reflection period. And like a lone individual in this image, the past year in several ways 
we've left many graduate students navigating programs, campuses, and campus cultures alone. In the field of higher education, for example, the ways that we have engaged with teaching, all aspects of research, and navigating professional opportunities have all needed to look different. And especially, this is true for racially minoritized graduate students who have been disproportionately impacted by the pandemic. Just as in our society at large, the pandemic has uh, has highlighted institutional failures in both policy and practice in terms of higher education institutions. And within our research today, we wanted to explicitly and unapologetically center Black students and their advisor, advisee relationships, as these relationships are explicitly important at the graduate level. For doctoral students, the advisor, advisee relationship highlights a sense of mentorship, professional guidance, as well as a sense of navigational capital for how to navigate institutions where black students and black faculty members are both underrepresented across the country at these institutions. So during our research, we wanted to highlight a framework for black students and their, um, and their advisors as well. Thank you, Isaiah, for the intro. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, I just wanna provide a brief overview of today's session. As you see on our screen, um, it's kind of the roadmap for today. So without going into extensive detail, um, I'll kind of outline the plan. So first, uh, I will frame our problem today, uh, and then I'll go into uh, discussing pertinent literature. Then we will talk about our theoretical frame of how to address the problem at hand, discuss some implications, offer some actionable steps, and then really uh, want to hear from you all and open up the floor um, to questions. So feel free to uh, add questions to the chat throughout as we are proceeding with the, the conversation. So the impetus for today's session stems from our experience in a graduate education program where in one sense, uh, we're fortunate to have a critical mass of black graduate students. Um, however, it became clear to each of us through various formal, informal, in-class and out-of-class experiences that the ramifications of a racially incongruent tenure track faculty needed more attention. And this is especially relevant to graduate uh, education programs as they enroll the highest percentage of black students and where the majority of tenured faculty are white. Um, therefore, our goal for today is really to discuss the implications of the faculty student racial mismatch, as well as the impacts on black doctoral students in schools of education. In a review of the literature, um, it's helpful to contextualize our problem and the impacts of faculty on PhD students. So as I alluded to earlier, um, one of the primary functions of PhD faculty is to socialize their students. And so socialization is really the process by which newcomers learn specific behaviors in their area of expertise and the system of meanings and values associated with these behaviors. And so socialization is a crucial component in the doctoral process as it really acclimates students to the field, preparing them to grow into their own academic being. And as I mentioned earlier, this occurs both in formal and informal um, settings and interactions between faculty and students. So most formal uh, socialization focuses on the written professional knowledge, emphasizing common skills, but often fails to address the unstated and unwritten rules of academia or even academic culture. Uh, and so considering that most PhD programs are pipelines into the professoriate, uh, this quote from Jones et al. captures the tension that we discuss today. So a quote, underrepresented racial slash ethnic doctoral students receive the academic preparation needed for socialization, but frequently lack the social, social interaction with faculty and others where knowledge of the rules for success is provided, end quote. And so, in addition to socialization, faculty of, are, of course, tasked with advising their doctoral students. And so depending on the doctoral program, faculty may have one or several doctoral students they accept any given year. And their role as advisors is really to, to fulfill uh, the following functions um, broadly. So it could be counseling, a sort of confirming of progress, sponsoring, protecting, role modeling, networking, and informing. And so this is also um, this also manifests in various uh, six distinct advisor types, um, as coined by Noy and Ray: affective, instrumental, intellectual, available, respectful, and sometimes even exploitive. And so these six archetypes 
uh, and the aforementioned functions um, touch on many of the aspects that we will put forth later uh, in the presentation with our own theoretical mo model around other mothering. One more note. And so um, we, we, we thought it was very important also to note that um, although the focus of today's conversation is on race, the literature overwhelmingly uh, demonstrates that Black women in particular um, have another layer of challenges um, that come along with the socialization process that academia uh, sort of imposes. And to what Jamin was talking about, when we are thinking about doctoral advising, uh, we, we also have to think about intersectionality and how gender and other factors might also impact the ways that Black women in particular experience their PhD or doctoral programs. And so we know the intersectionality was coined by one of my favorite scholars, Kimberly Crenshaw, um, and, and intersectionality is actually an analytic concept. And it's grounded in Black feminist and critical race theories to illustrate how women of color are differently situated in economic, social, and political worlds. And we know that there's a dearth in literature examining Black women's experiences with state-sanctioned violence, violence against Black trans women, uh, mass incarceration, sexual violence, school suspensions, and overall the protection of Black women. So we just wanna make sure that we recognize um, that we need to combat these empirical defici deficiencies and we must acknowledge that Black women's experiences are also really pertinent when we're discussing Black PhD and doctoral students advising experiences. And so building on that, uh, the literature also points to common barriers for students of color as you see on your screen. Um, and so without a diverse faculty, students research, uh, which pursue, pushes against white hegemonic views and practices may actually have trouble finding support from faculty. And so this experience, as I mentioned earlier, may manifest in the classroom via interactions with professors and or when receiving feedback on writing or research ideas, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And so on your screen, uh, you will see this summed up as sort of intellectual isolation, neglect, or even a lack of respect. And so you can see that there is a very personal nature um, embedded in a very professional setting. And we hope to sort of tease that apart and uh, complicate it in a racialized uh, manner. Thank you. So as we are looking to highlight the benefits of having Black instructors, a lot of the literature focuses on the K through 12 space. And so to frame this discussion, I wanted to highlight the work of Dr. Uh, Gloria Latson Billings and her 1995 work on culturally responsive pedagogy. And one of the key assertions from that piece is that if not critiqued, cultural assimilation can be the norm of educational institutions. I uh, found this to be true at the K through 12 levels and at the higher education levels as well. And so one of the reasons why uh, culturally responsive pedagogy was important is to establish a sense of uh, rapport like with students and affirming their, their being. Uh, the research shows that on average Black teachers have uh, more affirming, higher expectations for Black students than non-Black teachers. And as Jane was just referring to with the sort of intellectual isolation that takes place, uh, that is the byproduct of cultural assimilation um, and the denouncement of um, what Black students bring to the classroom from their cultures, from their upbringings. And so by having these culturally relevant pedagogies, we can sort of um, center their experiences and the value they bring to the learning process. Um, in this regard, instructors, they also serve as information sources for students, um, especially regarding um, the work of Steele in regards to stereotype threat and, and the different forms of disrespect that students may face in the classroom. Uh, instructors form a, um, they form a a way that students can learn more about these institutions that they're navigating. And so by providing sources of information on how to navigate, they, they demonstrate value, especially when students and these instructors are uh, underrepresented in these institutions at large. In ideal scenarios, they can serve also as role models and guides uh, for navigating racially hostile environments. And as we move to the higher education context, uh, faculty members, they also provide navigational capital in terms of how to navigate uh, different milestones in the doctoral program, how to navigate searching on the job market, how to have conversations around um, negotiating for yourself like as a potential uh, job hire. Um, and so in the higher education context specifically, faculty members are able to serve as a sort of transition from the program itself to life as a, as a professor um, ultimately. So now we'll, we'll start as uh, thinking about the ways that other mothering could be used um, as a theoretical frame for the model that 
um, that we've developed. And so the idea of other mothering is really important to understand where it comes from. And so it um, stems from the legacy of uh, chattel slavery and it has a long history in the study of care and transformational change also within um, education spaces. The initial concept um, came from, again, chattel slavery um, in which surrogate caregivers, i.e. other mothers, were often required to provide care for children whose mothers had been physically separated from them. Along with that, scholars have continuously used this concept to explore and explain the ways that educators and black educators specifically have historically provided a sense of belonging, belonging and kinship for black students who are either away from home in a collegiate setting or maybe even in a K-12 setting. What's important here when we talk about black educators or educators more broadly, I'm not just talking about uh, teachers or professors or faculty or people like that. Um, educators is a very broad term. So in a K-12 space, they might, um, other mothering might take a form of um, the kind of care that a bus driver or a cafeteria worker or a custodian might, uh, might provide. And also in a higher education space might take the form of, let's say uh, somebody who's a program manager or a program director, or again, somebody in the cafeteria or the dining hall, all of those, kind of, those people are all educators in itself and they come together to help support students. And so other mothering, when we think about it as a theoretical frame, um, it's this uh, very strong um, ethic of care that's really for making sure that black students get what, the, get what they need, not just academically, but also in other forms. Because I know sometimes we think a lot about meeting students' needs um, and we're talking about making sure that they progress academically, but it's important to also think about meeting students' whole uh, needs. And so that might be physical needs or mental needs or spiritual needs or emotional needs. Those things are important as well. And this is particularly important because as we in academia and in education as black people work towards these efforts of making sure that we thrive and resist white, um, white supremacy, even though we're living in this sphere of anti-blackness that um, continues, it's important to have these kinds of relationships and these kinds of, um, of uh, people that are gonna uh, put, take part in our uh, educational journey. And so when we think about other mothering and why we might want that in doctoral education, it's important to think about even how we get into doctoral education. So there's issues of inaccessibility and gatekeeping that occur, um, whether it be through the GRE or whether it's through requirements for letters of reference or whether some programs are looking for prior research experiences all these different types of things um, typically impact um, Black students um, disproportionately. And so that's one issue even before we can get into doctoral education. Then once we actually get into doctoral education, then you're um, working through the first year screenings and qualifying exams, um, you're working through dissertation proposals and defenses, um, as well as actually doing the dissertation. And this is all happening with even all this is going on, but we haven't even gotten into the thing about Maybe students need to make sure that they're publishing. They need to make sure that they're presenting at conferences. They need to make sure that they're doing their own research projects while also doing their um, work for the research assistantships. And so there's a lot of different um, factors that are going into this. And then that is even in itself a place of privilege because there are plenty of graduate students, particularly and, and doctoral students who don't have any kind of funding through a research assistantship or a teaching assistantship. And so they may be working outside of, um, of their education as well. And so there's all these different types of things that are happening um, in doctoral education. And while students are going through all of those trials and tribulations, they're often doing that in racially hostile um, climates, particularly within historically white institutions and programs. And so it's important to think about why, again, why might we need this other mothering um, practice and why that might um, be important for doctoral education. And James is going to continue to really kind of shape and explain the model and explain how um, faculty and other folks can, specifically faculty, can, can support Black PhD students in the next slides. However, we thought it was important to kind of share a little bit more about our experiences and to explain a bit more around how we have experienced our PhD program. So our personal experiences inform the work that you're seeing. They inform the model that we have created um, and they really inform how we show up as PhD students and student activists. So before I get into um, the, the list of demands that we've publicly shared, it's really important to note that many of our, many of our faculty in our program, um, we attend a research one institution. It's very much focused around research. It's very much focused around um, making sure that people are, are prepared to be researchers. And, and that being said, um, at times we definitely have not 
um, received some, some of us have not received the support that we've needed. And some faculty who actually consider themselves anti-racist or allies have engaged in and supported anti-Black practices with their, with their doctoral students. However, it's also really important to note that we recognize that all of our faculty, that all of our faculty um, necessar don't necessarily have the same experiences in how they treat their students. And we know that USC Rossier faculty, there are some that have actively supported Black students. Some of them are actually on this call. And so we're really excited to have you here with us. Um, and that being said, to share a little bit more about the, the, our, our program for years, Black students in Rossier's PhD program have called on faculty to not only demonstrate a, a sincere commitment to edu educational equity, but also to examine and change inequitable structures within the program. The program has been historically white, such as many PhD programs, and most recently, within the last, I'd say, three, two to three cohorts of students have, have been um, significantly more black students, but this is only a recent thing. And we recognize that although more black students are getting admitted into the program, that doesn't necessarily that they necessarily mean that they are receiving the supports that they need. And because of that, for years, black students have been responsible for facilitating conversations on race with faculty. We have been in classrooms where we've literally almost been the instructors to talk about critical race theory and to explain equity and to bring in outside readings and, and quite literally teach our, our peers um, around anti-Blackness and about equity-minded practices and about um, how to make sure that we are really combating um, anti-Blackness. And to be quite honest, we don't get paid for that work. Um, we are paid to be research assistants and um, at times teaching assistants. However, we are not paid to teach our peers around these issues. Um, and because our unpaid labor was as basically our unpaid labor as unofficial instructors of diversity, equity, inclusion, um, it, it does bring a, a prestige to the institution. However, the lack of compensation, financial or otherwise, made us keenly aware that there was um, an insufficient concern for our well-being and our career trajectories. As many of you are on this call can, can attest to, whether you're a faculty member, um, a current PhD student, a master's student, or, um, or, or have been a student at some time, being a PhD student requires um, a, a lot of different types of work. We are researchers, we also teach, and we also are trying to eventually get a job one day. And it is exhausting to also do the work and the labor to explain anti-Blackness and to teach it to others when we're not being compensated for it. And despite the many email exchanges we had with our program over years, um, town halls, focus group conversations, task forces, listening sessions, reports, all of these things, um, it seemed that our efforts over the years to make faculty receptive to our racialized experiences were ignored. It made us extremely exhausted, to be quite frank. And because of this exhaustion, the P all of us Black PhD students came together and we created a list of demands. And it's a pretty lengthy list of demands. We're happy to talk more about those um, later in, in, the, in the presentation if you have questions around them. Um, and they were publicly, sh publicly shared and we had a lot of public uh, support on those demands. But I'll, I'll kind of focus um, just on one particular, one particular demand that we had. Our demand centered around three areas, faculty practices, funding, and transparency. But for purposes of this presentation, we thought it might be interesting to talk a little bit more about our uh, demand for our USC Rossier faculty to hire a cluster of three or more black tenure faculty. In particular, we demanded that this cluster hire of scholars focus on researchers whose work focuses on black experiences that address the embedded nature of anti-blackness in education. Um, and we also wanted the Black graduate students to be included in the hiring committees um, for these members. And the reason why we wanted Black tenure faculty is because we recognize that even as Black people in academia, even once we graduate, there are still uh, very much barriers 
to getting into a tenure track position, um, especially at a research one institution. And so we were very intentional around requesting and demanding um, three black tenure faculty members. And um, we essentially refuse to continue cycling and engaging in dialogue or joining task forces that never seem to actually give tangible outcomes. And that's why we created this list of demands. And I also, lastly, before I hand it over to James to talk more about our theoretical model, um, I want to recognize the labor that this, that this took. Being a Black PhD student, being a PhD student in general is already exhausting. Um, but to get a group of Black PhD students to create a whole entire list of demands and make sure that all of our concerns were, were there, it took a village, it took time, um, it took a lot of energy, and it took people really stepping up. Um, and I think that it's really important to recognize that the labor that even asking and, and really demanding um, what we need, it also, it, it took energy. So it's just important to note. Um, and then I'll go ahead and pass it to James. Thank you, Sarah, for that. Um, I think it's really important for us to, again, like in dealing with all of the issues that black graduate students and black doctoral students are facing in academia um, in our programs, it's important for us to think about when we're looking for, and we're going back to that advising piece, what should it actually look like? And looking at our theoretical um, model, how can we make this, uh, make other mothering um, a, something that happens in practice for uh, black doctoral students? So we know that faculty advising and mentoring is key to navigating academia. Um, again, as students are balancing coursework and research and service opportunities, many of them are happening for the first time. And particularly with black graduate students, as you've seen, we're often also navigating, again, racially hostile spaces. Um, so then in 2020, uh, McCallum actually described the benefits of other mothering and faculty student relationships, particularly related though to encouraging black students to pursue graduate education. And that was unique because she um, noted that those faculty student relationships that she observed, they could be characterized as other mothering. So that, um, and she came up with four um, key themes and four, and that's what builds out, we're extending um, to our model for black doctoral advising. So if these work to get students into doctoral education, we think that they might also be a really good practice to actually have when students are being advised um, throughout um, their doctoral journey. So the first one that um, she focused on was caring. And so it would seem that like, you know, black doctoral advising or the advising in general, yes, advisors should care. They should be caring people. Um, but it's particularly important in that it provides black graduate students with this understanding that they're valued, that they're important and that they're supported um, by their faculty advisor. It's not just uh, caring uh, about students because there's a difference between caring about and caring for students. I think we often find advisors and uh, faculty that do care about their students and caring about them means, yes, they care about their progress, they care about what's going on in their lives, but they don't necessarily care for them. And so this is kind of a shift as well, moving from caring about to caring for. And so that requires an emotional connection. And it's really key because it um, ensures some level of validation as students are working through their experiences within the institution, within um, a lot of these organizations that, if we're being honest, they were explicitly designed um, for their exclusion. And so this caring can take a lot of different forms and it really should be negotiated between the student and the faculty member. We're not here to tell you that caring looks one way and that's exactly how it looks and how it should be. Um, but it's important to think that as you're working with your advisees, there are ways that you all negotiate that. Um, so examples of that though might include weekly check-ins about students' life, lives outside of academia. It might um, be talking about their family needs or as well as their material needs. Um, one of the most important things about this level of care is that it has to be gen genuine and authentic um, instead of being performative. So for example, if an advisor asks a student how they're doing at the beginning of a meeting, which typically happens because we care, we do that in regular practice. We might meet somebody in, in the, well, not in the street now because of COVID, but pre-COVID, we might have been meeting people um, in the hallways or on campus and saying, oh, well, how are you doing? And oftentimes when we ask those questions, we're not actually asking for a response or a response that's actually authentic. It's really just a practice that we do. It's more of a routine. And so with this, we really want to think about when you're asking those questions at the beginning of a meeting, um, even if it's a research meeting, you only have but so much time. And if, like, if a student responds that they're running low on food or dealing with an illness or they have a family issue, 
there's this heightened level of care that needs to be provided before continuing on to whatever that task is that you all are trying to um, complete that day. Now, I'm not saying that the faculty member needs to feed the students themselves or the faculty member needs to provide them with medical care or figure out how to do stuff with their family, but there's just a way of caring that does need to happen. Um, and they, and because we know that faculty are in a different position that um, does have more privilege and does have oftentimes more prestige than graduate students, it's important that they can maybe use those, um, the levers that they might have to be able to help those students meet those needs. And this is also important when we're moving into high expectations, which was the next, um, the next part of the model. So, or I'm sorry, actually keeping it real is the next part of the model. Um, so when we're talking about keeping it real, it's really important um, for that genuine relationship or that genuine connection, um, because it's important that you have honesty, that you have authenticity, and that you trust, uh, there's a trustworthiness that actually is within that, um, that advising relationship. So students have to feel that they can trust their advisor, um, and that their advisor has their best interests at heart. Um, this is particularly important as students are navigating all the different milestones that they're expected to complete. And then also faculty have to keep it real. When we say keeping it real, it means providing a realistic picture of the journey to the PhD or, and finishing. Because, and sometimes when we think about keeping it real, um, we're like, well, maybe we don't need to tell them that just yet. Maybe we can actually wait and all of that. But it's important to not do that. It's important to keep it real the entire time and tell students exactly what they might be facing, what they might need to be doing. If there's something that they're not doing that's correct, be sure to address that and make sure that you're being upfront, honest, and authentic, because students definitely do need that. Um, we know that in doctoral education, there's a deep hidden curriculum. Um, and it's important to also think about when we're keeping it real, and also when we're doing caring, it's not just that we are assimilating students through this department or through this program or through these institutions. It's actually important as well for, um, for faculty, advisors, and students to kind of work as co-conspirators to figure out how we can actually tear down some of these barriers and structures that are making the doctoral journey more, um, more stressful and more difficult than, it's, than it needs to be. Um, again, it doesn't need to be any form of assimilation. So I wanna make sure that when we're talking about keeping it real, it's not that, oh, this is just how academia is and we just need to figure it out and work through it. That's not necessarily it. It goes, um, goes more than that. So instead of just learning how to make it through academia, the advising relationship can actually be this really good generative space where students and faculty are working together to figure out how to actually change the academy and make it a better place, um, which is then important as we get into thinking about high expectations. Um, because when we're talking about high expectations um, for black grad students, and we're dealing with trying to fix the academy and do our own research and all these different things, um, we know that sometimes um, people might say, well, maybe we should like, you know, let them slide on something, or maybe they don't need to take on an extra projects or all these things. Um, and that's fair, that's a level of care and that's um, a way of caring and that's important too. But we also know that black students um, and black faculty are, he are held to higher standards, either well, they're, when they're in their program, but also once they leave and they go to tenure track positions or if they go outside of academia, either way, black people are often held to higher standards. And so it's important to make sure that those high expectations are there throughout the entire process, particularly though during the early formative years um, of the doctoral journey. So we know that the, the beginning few years of that journey, they can be daunting in so many different ways because students are expected to learn um, new theories, they're expected to learn new methods and apply those methods and learn these new practices and do all these things, all the while navigating, again, an often hostile um, academy. And so again, it might seem that it might be a caring practice to lower those expectations, but that practice, which we've seen in other research shows that it's actually inherently problematic and quite frankly, it's actually anti-Black. And so it positions Black students as deficient or in need of support in ways that don't honor the experiences, funds of knowledge, and brilliance that they're bringing into the academy. So even if, even if a Black graduate student might be struggling and all of that, that doesn't necessarily mean that they can't do it. It means that maybe they just need support in different ways. And so it's important to make sure that you're working to provide, um, provide that support to them. And again, we know it's um, critical that you do this because once students graduate and they go into their um, their career fields, they're going to be dealing with some of the same things. And so having that routine and having that practice already set is going to be helpful in helping them be really successful once they graduate. Now, the next one, identity connections, that's one where it gets a little bit tricky um, because I know that sometimes uh, our, the whole focus of our, our uh, talk today is on uh, being accepted to assimilate and the mismatch between faculty advisors um, and, and their um, doctoral students. And so one of the things that's key here is that 
when we're talking about other mothering um, as a model for Black doctoral advising, I don't. I want to make sure that it's clear that other mothering can happen. It doesn't only have to happen from Black faculty. It can also happen from non-Black faculty. Um, and a lot of these things that we're talking about, um, again, caring, keeping it real, high expectations and identity connections. It's also important to note that just because a faculty member is Black, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're actually doing all of these advising practices. And so it's important that um, we recognize that and show that, again, all faculty can be doing this kind of work. Um, but as we get back to identity connections, um, it's also, again, uh, continuing th with this theme of genuine, authentic care um, and other mothering form of um, doctoral advising with identity connections, it really would involve us making sure that you actually invest time to connect with students over shared, shared connections. Now, this isn't a space or a time, I'm not gonna advise you to, um, if you have a black graduate student to go out and start trying to watch a lot of black TV or to try to um, listen to a lot of black music or try to do different things like that, you can if that's something that you'd like to do. But this is you also outside of that, you might also have other um, shared identities um, that might be helpful. And you could you build on those to actually bring that um, genuine connection together. Um, that might be different histories with food, or maybe you do have some shared musical interests or art or any number of ways that you could um, build this strong bond. And again, it's gonna be grounded in those shared identities. Um, and so again, it's not, this is, uh, it's important to remember though, that when you're doing this, that all of these, these identities in many different ways are racialized. And it's important that, like, that um, we think about that as we're doing this work. Um, so when we get together and we're thinking about this whole model, those four things are important. And we know that those things um, might be very beneficial for Black students um, as they're going through their PhD program. Um, our model, we would love to actually see this. We've created it, we've extended it from um, McCallum's earlier work, but we're thinking that if this model, if we could actually see this in practice, and then we could actually work um, with uh, different PhD programs and advisors to kind of see how this might work, we think this might really be something that could benefit Black graduate students, again, not just in our program, of course, but really more broadly and all throughout academia. So our experiences in our proposed framework bring us to several implications. And while there are relevant implications for students, we chose today to really focus on implications for faculty and administrators, who we'd argue should be held accountable for enhancing the departmental and, and institutional climate for Black doctoral students, particularly given the racial mismatch that we find across students and faculty and doctoral programs. So we'll begin with Acosta and their colleagues and their discussion of the need for formal and informal spaces for students, faculty, and staff to engage in intellectual dialogue around issues related to race, racism, and oppression in broader society, as well as how all of these things shape the experiences of Black and other racially minoritized students within a doctoral program. Our own experiences support this study and others that have suggested the necessity of coupling these opportunities for dialogue with curricular and pedagogical approaches that center emancipatory approaches. And we think this should be formalized within the core curriculum of doctoral programs in schools of education. We also think that faculty and staff have to prioritize educating themselves about the historical and contemporary racism that shaped the experiences of black and other minoritized doctoral students, particularly within the context of their own departments and institutions. They must unlearn the privileging of Eurocentric norms that pervade doctoral programs and develop policies and programming that are specifically designed to support black doctoral students. To do so, they must actually listen to the unique needs of their Black students rather than assume that they know what they need. And at the same time, administrators must examine how existing policies and practice impact Black doctoral students and be willing to take action in ways that mitigate both systemic and interpersonal acts of anti-Blackness. Administrators must also be willing to hold their colleagues, especially other faculty members, accountable, accountable for perpetuating anti-Blackness, whether this is in the classroom or on social media. Given the dearth of Black tenure faculty in most doctoral programs, which is another issue altogether, faculty and administrators must be especially intentional in understanding the unique needs of Black students. Felder and Barker stress the importance of one-to-one -one mentoring as students unfamiliar with the doctoral education program, the doctoral education experience often struggle to understand its hidden aspects. And various studies suggest that the most successful relationships involve faculty regardless of race, who are aware of how the socio-political context shapes the specific experiences of their Black student mentees. And again, our own experiences support this finding. Finally, this discussion has really important implications for the future of academia. 
Blockett and their colleagues, among other scholars, have demonstrated how the doctoral education experience shapes students' intentions to join the professoriate. And as administrators consider ways to diversify their faculties, we posit that they should first examine their own school's approaches to doctoral education and find ways to strengthen faculty mentorship, professional involvement, and environment to support three factors that have been found to be critical to the socialization of Black students into academia. To put it simply, we, we wanna reiterate the importance of just listening to your Black students. Rather than focusing on implementing best practices, we call on you and encourage you to reflect on how you can be pre best practitioners attuned to the unique phenomenon of anti-Blackness, as well as the, the emancipatory am ambitions and aspirations of your Black doctoral students. So we have now uh, left you with quite a bit of information and experiences, and we hope that it has been helpful. So we want to kind of talk a little bit more about our final thoughts in general. These aren't necessarily um, in slides per se, but we wanted to do some reflection before we opened it up to our questions um, for you all and then questions that you have for us. We first want to recognize that the experiences we have we, we, we understand that they're not solely specific to USC. We can use our experiences as PhD students, as Black PhD students at USC. But we also recognize that many of these experiences surpass institutions and that they are really kind of embedded in a variety of institutions, whether it be a research one institution or not. And that's why our model can be used for a variety of different programs and different concentrations. Also, I know that we have some students that aren't PhD students on the call. And so I wanted to kind of uh, briefly talk about the advisor relationship in general. Um, one of the things that I personally didn't know and maybe a couple of, of my colleague friends and I didn't know either is that uh, an advisor is, is, is pretty different in a PhD program. When you're in an undergraduate program, even in a master's program, right, your advisor might be someone who does just that, literally advises you, helps you kind of pick out what classes you're going to take, um, might even be a mentor to some capacity. However, when you are, um, at least for our program, most programs too, you have to, right, um, suggest or apply almost to work with particular faculty. You research these faculty, you look at their work, you look at their publications, you say, hey, can I see myself working with this person? Let me talk to their students. What are their experiences? And it, it, it's it until you get into that experience where you then realize, wow, I've been accepted into a PhD program and now I have an advisor. Um, this advisor relationship is actually very important because not only is this advisor somebody that you're going to be working with, doing work for, and collaborating with, but it's also someone that you were going to be thought partnering with. It's also somebody that might give you um, emotional support as well as you navigate um, all of the things in academia and also life, right? Because we all experience our personal lives with family and friends and other people where um, our advisors also are, are, are supposed to be people that we can confide in and be transparent about um, what we might be dealing with or going through. In addition, really important to note that the advisor is someone who might also be in your life for quite some time because once you apply to jobs, you need letter of recommendations and your advisor is somebody who hopefully over the last four to five years you've created some type of relationship with and you can trust that they can write you a very strong letter of recommendation and also help you um, navigate the job market um, to the best of their ability. So the advisor relationship is actually really critical for any PhD student. Um, and then when we couple identity in, into that as well, being a Black PhD student, um, it, it's even more, um, I think, important that we, we talk about Black doctoral advising experiences. In addition, something that James brought up in the model was this idea of being a co-conspirator. Um, and I love Bettina's Patina, Dr. Patina loves uh, work around co-conspiratorship. And one of the th things that, um, that Dr. Patina Love talks about in being a co-conspirator is that it's not the same as allyship. Being a co-conspirator really means that you are willing to put things on the line. You're willing to put um, anything on the line, whether that be your whether that be you know you your your day or your finances or your energy or whatever it might be if you are really con committed to being an anti-racist person and to being a co-conspirator um it's really important that you actively do that 
And that being said, for faculty or um, that are on this call who are who are interested in becoming better better faculty and better advise, um, advisors to Black students and, and, and students in general, um, I think that being a co-conspirator is, is definitely somewhere to start, as well as the model that we've provided. But I'll open it up to, to some of my colleagues um, for final thoughts as well. Yeah, I can go ahead. Um, I'd like to just uh, recognize that the you know the bulk of our presentation is focused on faculty and the relationship between PhD students and their faculty. But as we were discussing and preparing for this discuss, um, conversation, we all sort of acknowledge that um, our support is not limited by faculty, and that we have in fact been uh, greatly supported by staff members and um, field uh, folks that we are working with uh, in the field. So. I noticed in the chat that not everybody's a PhD student, not, not everyone's an aspiring student or a professor. Some of you all are deans. Some of you are all um, student service um, um, staff members. And so we would like to encourage you all to sort of embrace the theoretical um, model that we've put forth today and not feel like because you don't have um, the title um, that you can't support Black students in very crucial, if not sometimes more important ways than faculty can, right? Because there is always this power dynamic um, that we are kind of managing. And, and sometimes your role as a non-faculty member can actually be more beneficial. Um, so it was, I just wanted to kind of like shout out our, our staff as well as encourage the staff on this call to uh, embrace what we have put forth today. And I want to echo Jamin's remarks. Um, as a former staff member, I think, and as a former, you know, student at a PWI, the most support and other mothering that I received was from identity centers. And so I would encourage faculty to actually cultivate relationships with staff members who are doing a really good job of this, um, sort of subvert the hierarchy that unfortunately exists across higher ed institutions and really lean into folks who are doing this really well. You know, I think the faculty staff binary is like such an unfor unfortunate thing that exists um, in higher ed spaces. And so I would encourage, uh, yeah, faculty to learn from staff members. I think, I think it's really, really important. Any other final thoughts from our panelists here? Yeah, I can briefly add, add on. Um, as you all were speaking, I was also thinking about our last demand, the major area of transparency. And as we were sort of thinking about how assimilation functions on campuses. It largely happens through um, the policies and everyday practices and the institutional like just everyday functions. And so regardless of, of your role, I feel like it's important if there is a knowledge of had institutional knowledge of like how your program functions, I feel like in sharing that information with students uh, can go a long way in sort of promoting um, some of these like liberatory practices that we're talking about. Um, so just an, an, a reminder and encouragement in some ways to uh, the knowledge that you share of the institution is immensely valuable uh, to students and faculty members alike. The only thing that I'll add at the end, and I know that I talked about this a lot during the uh, actually breaking down the model sum, but the biggest thing that we can keep doing is really being, bringing in this idea of genuine authentic care. Um, I can't say that enough. Care is important, making sure that you are actually checking in with students, making sure that you know what's going on with their lives. Right now, we're living through, um, still living through a global pandemic. We're still living through, of course, the, again, the air of anti-Blackness that just embeds itself in everything that we do. Um, we're living through a movement for racial reckoning and justice. We're moving, living through, um, in some ways, political upheaval. And so there's so many different things that are going on. And academia is important. And of course, you know, we all are going through PhD programs. We chose to go through PhD programs. We are invested in this. But life actually does get hard. And there is also life outside of a PhD program. And so it's important as an advisor um, or as a mentor or as anybody who's in this higher ed space to continue to check on each other and actually show care um, in a genuine way. Again, not just simply saying, hey, how are you? And not really listening for what's actually happening, but truly listening, as Caitlin said earlier, listening to Black students when they're telling you about what's going on, what issues they might be having, and how that um, how that might be if, if, uh, impacting them. So I just think, again, if we can keep centering care, if we can keep centering genuine, um, authentic, really love in all of this, I think that we can actually make some um, something happen. Absolutely. Care is so important. Um, absolutely. I, I, 
honestly am so um, grateful that we've been able to share this space with you all. And now we're going to transition into first um, a question that we have for you all, and then we'll go into um, questions that you have for us. And I know I, I've seen so many questions already and I'm really excited to dive into them. But first, um, briefly, if you don't, you don't have to answer, but if you're interested, given your positionality, how might you enact change given what we addressed? Um, and while you're answering that question, we will just take a couple minutes here to, uh, to wait and then we'll address some of the responses and go into a general Q&A that you have for us in our presentation. And our contact information is here. Uh, we'll leave this up here. If you all are interested in contacting us, um, we all have a variety of different expertises, um, but we all do a variety of different work in terms of consulting, in terms of like um, other professional work. If you're interested in, in guest speakers or anything like that, feel free to email any of us. Thank you so much. Uh... Isaiah, Sarah, James, Jamon, and Kaylan, we really appreciate your presentation. You can stop sharing your screen now and we can go into Q&A. I really do appreciate this presentation. As somebody who has worked for a long, long time with undergraduates, I, I almost understand this theory, theoretical framework of other, we call it other mothering. And I feel like we do a lot of that for undergraduates, but really when you're in, in grad school, it's, it's almost like you're on your own. <laughs> it's like you're in that desert. And um, I think it's a real good reminder that you all are human beings as well. You're not just students, you're also human beings with different needs. So I do like that theoretical framework. My, my worry is, um, how is this going to impact faculty, especially faculty of color who are already doing some of this through that invisible labor uh, in most of these campuses through DNI work? Uh, can any of you respond to that? And then I'll dive in into other questions. I'll start um, and I invite my colleague friends to, to step in. Um, so I think this is just a slice of what we see as a solution. Um, so several of us are actually budding org theorists, organizational theorists. And so we're thinking more systemically about how everything needs to change. Um, so thinking about the inequities that faculty of color currently experience, we totally acknowledge that. We see them every day, we, we've experienced them. And so I don't think our, I don't, I don't want an, an, an implication that folks walk away with to be that like, you know, folks of color, particularly women of color, who like we, our experiences and research have shown are doing so much of this other mothering now need to be doing more. I think what we're trying to say is that um, given the work that these incredible folks are already doing, there are so many lessons to be learned across the faculty, even if it's not your own faculty, if you look to models, across the academy of folks who are really doing this work in important ways. And, and uh, Dr. Rungu, I appreciate your point because like a lot of this work does happen, whether it's like the community college level all the way up to doctoral education, there are like so many models of great other mothering, right? So I think while we're pushing for systemic overhaul generally so that there's not this uh, overburdening on certain folks, we just decided to focus on this particular slice given where we are in this particular amount of, in this particular slice of time, um, we hope that like, there's not racial mismatch, right? And there is a more better match in terms of values that are important to advising and teaching. But for now, where we are currently, I think we just wanted to focus on this, but I think that's an important asterisk. So I'm, I'm, I appreciate that you brought up that, that point um, because yeah, we should make that explicit. And y'all, if y'all have other thoughts, so, and I know definitely can be applied to other uh, marginalized students as well and other marginalized faculty as well. Uh, we do have an anonymous attendee uh, and they say they are black in blackets, mixed PhD student. 
I'm often the only black student in the class or the room. I am not one that tries to make every class an issue into a black debate type of thing. <laughs> So often, whatever lesson we are working on, conversation we are having, most of which are not specifically about race at all, needs to be moved in a new liberating direction. I am always cautious though, because I don't want to make my time at the university harder than it has to be by bringing extra attention upon myself in what could be seen by some in a negative way. How do you all navigate similar situations such as this? Or if you can't relate, how would you possibly handle these types of issues? I'm sure you can relate. You're probably the only black student in your PhD class. Can one or two of you tell us, how do you navigate being that so black person and everybody wants you to represent the black race? Sometimes that happens. This is a really good, um, this, is, this is really interesting. I was reading this question. I want to also say that, um, in my own experience, typically I've been, in my higher edu education experience, typically I've only been, yep, the only black person in most of my classes. It actually wasn't until my PhD program that I was in classes with black students because the, uh, the semester that I was admitted, there were 13 in the cohort and mm -hmm. six of us identified as black. Um, it was a whole thing. We call each other super six. KB is actually, or Caitlin is actually part of the super six. So um, I honestly would not be here would, if without the super six, I'll be quite honest with you. Uh, however, um, and in that space, like it was actually the most liberating thing I've ever experienced to be in a space with black students um, and like have other people around me amplify my voice. However, when I took my cognitive courses, I took my courses outside of Rossier. Um, I was the only black PhD student. And I remember being in a class where uh, similarly to the person that, that answered or that asked this question, um, I was the only person. I didn't necessarily want to continuously every single week, and that class was, was twice a week. So twice a week um, engage around being that black woman, that black person who always brings up race. Um, I think, one of the pieces of advice I would give you is to um, is to show up authentically, whatever that looks like it means for you. If it means that every class you're being disruptive, I completely encourage you to disrupt, do that. However, also manage your, your own feelings and your emotions, take care of yourself because it is exhausting and it will lead to burnout. Um, you do not have to feel guilty if you're talking about race in class and you do not want to talk that day. Actually, in one of our classes, we felt like um, we were always asked to talk about race. So the Super Six that day, that class, we decided we're not going to say anything in class. And we let all of our peers, that was very interesting, um, but we let all of our peers take over. So yeah, absolutely. Be authentic, be yourself, and take care of yourself. Um, thank you. What about, what about in HBCUs? That's what you know. Eugene is asking. You know, HBCUs are majority uh, are black students, they may not feel isolated in that sense, but do you think uh, the framework of mothering, are the mothering applies to them? It actually comes from research on HBCU. So yeah, I mean, in the same way that I think faculty at PWIs, particularly R1s and R2s have so much to learn from Staff members, I think that we need to look to institutions that are serving black and brown students way better than most of our institutions are. Um, so whether it's you know looking at the research or whether it's just like make, building relationships with practitioners who are doing this work, which I think I would argue is even more important. Um, I think, yeah, HBCUs are an incredible model for the, way, the ways in which other mothering should and is working, should be working and is working um, every day. James, I didn't want to cut you off. No, I mean, you said exactly what I was going to say, is that this really did it. it this notion of other mothering, um, when I think about it, honestly, like this is everything that we have talked about in that model, that level of care, that's often what you find at HBCUs. You find um, so many caring people, and again, caring educators across the board not necessarily just in the classroom. Yes, faculty advising, that part is important. But again, and I said it during the presentation, 
there are some amazing caring educators who are working in dining halls and who are working in the, who are our custodians and who are working um, our grounds people. All those people, they bring, they play a part in this whole other mothering space. And so it's not just on one person necessarily to do it, but it's really on the collective. So as we think about what we can actually do, we can, um, we can actually bring people together across uh, role type and all that to be able to continue to build um, up our black students. You know, somebody is mentioning we also need other brothering. So, and I would say, yes, it's mothering, it's brothering, it's sistering, it's, it's I, I think it's the concept of building those relationships and the concept of, you know, taking care of each other. But somebody is asking, and, and I bet probably a prospective student here, how do you uncover that good advisor, that good support system, that good program? I see Jamon is shaking his head. Do you want to respond to that, Jamon? <laughs> yeah, that's a great question. And I wish I had, um, <laughs> you know, a tool for you to see through uh, the you know, quite frankly, the performance that uh, a university bio or website bio or uh, somebody's research may sort of put on. Um, but I think my go-to strategy uh, that I've learned, applied, and, and continue to offer is talk to grad students. Talk to uh, the current students who are under the professor that you want to work with. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it's very difficult uh, to determine whether you will be a one-to-one -one fit and whether your personality will match with theirs. Of course, you can tell by their research, um, but at the end of the day, it is an interpersonal relationship that will require um, some experience. And, you know, of course, if you can't meet with the advisor one-on-one, uh, -on -one, I think it's best to talk to their students. Um, if you can find, you know, their alumni, it's just best, better to learn from other folks' experience and start to piece together the information that they give you and also recognize that sometimes um, they may be giving you an incomplete history. So really just playing detective work, um, but doing all that you can to hear from um, the folks that have worked with them in particular. And you see Marlene Williams is, is one of those. Uh, she says that she's a black woman faculty uh, who often advocates for black students. Uh, I am interested in the ways that the relationship between non-black faculty and black students can impact the higher rates of remediation that we see happening with black graduate students. In particular, what are your thoughts about this and how might other mothering help mitigate against black students being disproportionately remediated in their cannabis programs? You know, you, you talked about high expectation and sometimes we see that not happening <laughs> and, and everybody being boxed in into, you know, you need more of this. So uh, can you uh, speak more of that in one of you? Sure. I guess for me, I, oh, nope. sorry. I, was just wondering, I was just wondering what was meant specifically by remediation? Because I, uh, I guess I can kind of see like maybe thinking that, you know, but they might need extra, like again, extra support and like maybe extra academic support yeah. or things like that. And that, again, that's that's a fair question. I think it's important. Um, but I do think, again, going back to that, how those high expectations, that's why it's very important for faculty to also listen and understand what, what where Black graduate students are coming in, what they're coming in with and what, um, and the skills that they already have. I think, at least for me, one of the things that I can say about the very beginning maybe of my um, graduate experience is that I felt very infantilized. Like I felt like I had, I was coming in and I didn't know anything, but I was leaving a career where I was very successful. Mm -hmm. I was, I had already earned my master's degree. I was, had done all these things. So while there were things in academia that I of course needed to know and needed to learn, mm -hmm. I also had a lot, whole set of experiences and, um, and background that actually could have been very, very beneficial. And so I think in order to push back against that, other mothering would, would encourage us to make sure that one, we listen to black graduate students, we understand who they are, we care about who they are. And because we've built that relationship with them to deeply understand their backgrounds and where they um, have come from, I think that would help remediate against that. And again, not, make, not positioning them as deficient or not positioning them as uh, needing Again, like additional support. Additional support is fine in some ways if the student needs it, but finding out what they need first instead of just assuming 
oh, you're a black graduate student, you're gonna need to go to the writing center. You're gonna need to do X, Y, and Z. Those things aren't necessary. Those are, again, anti-black practices in themselves. And so it's important to honor the experiences that students have when they come into the institutions. Uh, and the opposite of that, James, is we see with our Asian students with uh, Asian backgrounds is this that modern minority me that all of them may be doing very well. And, and sometimes they really do need the support. Uh, so I think Robin's question about how faculty step up at the mothering, James, you have answered that. And uh, if any of you have suggestions, maybe you have done this other mothering, maybe you didn't have a vocabulary for it, now you do, uh, you can drop in the chat and people can learn from you. But I wanna go to a next question here. Would you be willing to share uh, your reference list for this presentation? Yes, uh, they will put that in their presentation and you can email anchorwebinars.ou.edu. Uh, we are going to provide you with that. So how was your demand to hire three black faculty met by the department? Isn't it illegal <laughs> to discriminate for, again, is hiring someone on the basis of their race or ethnicity? Additionally, how might this lead to the tokenization of these folks once they are hired, e.g. you are only here because you are diversity hire, which you are aims, uh, underrepresented minorities already often here without this type of recruitment initiatives. I really want a couple of you to respond to that because we hear this all the time. Most of us in the academia, everybody is, is trying to think maybe we are here because of X, Y, Z and not because uh, we are professionals who are very, very qualified to be where we are. So can you respond to that before I, uh, you know, I start running? <laughs> <laughs> I can answer a little part of it and then maybe some of my friends um, can also respond. I want to first say that um, our main our main role as PhD students writing these demands was for once to make it all about us. We didn't necessarily say how they were going to do that. That was not our responsibility because we're not the hiring committee. However, we also wanted in our demands that we wanted faculty, not only a cluster hire of black faculty, but we wanted faculty whose research focuses on anti-blackness mm -hmm. and anti-racism. Now, mm -hmm. that being said, I don't know about you, but a majority of critical work that I've read that happens to be around anti-blackness and anti-racism are from, from folks of color, are from um, critical folks of color and then the critical white people that I do know this do this work too they would say they wouldn't even take the position because they recognize that it might be more better suited for a person of color I think that um, another thing is that we requested that we be in the room for whatever candidates that they, they that, that they bring in that being said um, I don't want to speak for everyone but I think that we would be open to um we just want we just want critical faculty mm -hmm. if they're not black that's also okay mm -hmm. um but in our demand we said black faculty because that's what demands are you reach for the stars and if you don't get it that's okay um but i i hope that answers a little bit of it i think you you are right in saying uh and i'm gonna paraphrase this as well if you know culture, how to work from a culturally responsive approach, perspective, uh, cultural competency is really not about being black or being brown. Although as Sarah said, majority of folks who are interested in these approaches tend to be faculty of color. But you don't have to be a faculty of color to work from a perspective that includes uh, CRPs and you know uh, CRTs in your curriculum. Uh, so I agree. I think everybody needs to be culturally competent and work through that uh, and serve their students better that way. You know, as you presented your demands, and, and this is for uh, for the group. Did you think about unionizing or? somebody is asking about that. How is this uh, graduate student unionizing connected to, to what you're talking about today? I think related to the demands, some of the demands, yes, they definitely would align with some of what uh, different groups across the country that have been pushing for grad student unionizing. 
they would align with some of these things um, around, especially around like the funding and like making sure that, you know, there's not um, unfair labor practices and things like that. So that would align with it. Um, I guess the where it wouldn't necessarily maybe would be again around like some of the hiring practices and things like that. But I do think that, yes, this, um, it could be aligned and it could definitely be something um, that could be again, a collaborative effort. Um, I don't, from, and y'all please correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't remember us having a lot of conversations about unionizing during this. I think for this particular demand and this, uh, or set of demands, we really were, uh, I guess for the most part, just fed up with what was going on mm -hmm. and really wanted to figure out, okay, as a black PhD student collective, what can we do and what can we present today that we could possibly get some traction on right now? Um, again, joining a union and all of that, that's a separate issue. And if people wanted to do that and we wanted to eventually do that, that's totally fine to talk about. But this wasn't necessarily related to that. But I do see that there's some parallels between the uh, ideas that around unionizing for grad students and also what we were talking about as, as Black grad students making these demands. Mm -hmm. And I can maybe jump in here. I, I'm actually the, our school's one of our reps for the graduate students who are organizing to unionize. Mm -hmm. um, there's a group of PhD students across the university. And so I think even though, I think we're actually in a relatively privileged position in our school, even though it's not a privileged position, but like we're not, we don't have to teach a bunch of undergraduates for like minimal pay. Like we, we're in a very, we, you know, we, we, when we sign our papers, it's like, you, you know that at least you have at least four years of funding, which is very unique across our schools at USC. At the same time, um, our organization that is organizing for grad students to unionize, they, they have put anti-Blackness at the forefront as like one of their uh, like thrusts, right? So I think that where, where we could potentially intersect and I'm hoping to like co-lead this charge is that like when we talk about policing, when we talk about you know, contingent faculty who are, who are predominantly Black and Latinx and Indigenous, we talk about some of these other issues like, yeah, we should be talking about how the role of unionization and neoliberalism generally is like informing the predicament that we're in where we're teaching faculty members <laughs> making a fraction of their salaries, not to get like too, you know, radical on this call. But I think, yeah, there's a, there are a lot of parallels to be drawn. And I think that if we, so uh, an answer that I thought about um, to an earlier question around like, what is a way to sort of mitigate some of these silos is to build coalitions across the university. In a place like USC, in a place like most R1s, you know, there are folks who are facing similar struggles, just we're all siloed. So I think if we could think about ways to be more intentional to like connect with other doctoral students in other places and like really build solidarity in terms of the struggles that are happening. And I, and I think about contingent faculty most, like I think like, PhD students and contingent faculty have so many similar experiences. And if we could just sort of like learn about one another, our collective struggles and like work together, then I think organizing will play a really, really important role in like bolstering our demands, other folks' demands and like, yeah, all the things. So I think, I think that's a really great question. And I think it's really uh, important what you just said, uh, building uh, partnerships and relationships not just from those in your university, but across institutions. This platform is, is one way we try to do that. Uh, your names are out there now. Uh, students can come to you, they can ask you questions, uh, you know, mentoring a little bit. So one of them is asking, you know, give me a tip. Uh, what would you give a student of color? What tips? So as we summarize this, can each of you give a tip of how to be that PhD student in your current environment, uh, understanding that what you're experiencing is being experienced by other historically marginalized groups across this country. And I will just call out on you as I see you on my screen, James, you go first. <laughs> Can you just one more time, maybe explain like what was. Yeah, speak directly to a prospective PhD student, a current PhD student of color who is trying to survive the academia. Uh, maybe speaking directly to that student or to that faculty member or to that staff member, this is what I ask of you. I want you to support me this way for my success in this institution. And that could be any institution. 
Yeah. Um, I think, well, okay. So I think that's really good for me. I think, and again, I keep going back to it. You have to actually care about people. Um, I think that we do a great job of performing care. We do a great job of saying that, yeah, we really do. We're invested in who you are, but are you really? Like that's when it really comes down to it. So I think the best thing that we can do is when you say something, mean it. When you say that you care, actually do something to show that you care um, instead of the more uh, performative aspects of it. So if people are looking for faculty mm -hmm. advisors or they're looking for programs, making sure that that care that it's being shown is actually authentic is important so uh, be real stop performing be real that's the best way to put it be real because that performance <laughs> we're honestly we're tired <laughs> we're tired of the performances all right isaiah thank you james yes um i would say i, I guess two brief things is once a, it's essential to carve out a space of home on on campus um that may mean um, individuals and forming relationships, um, like with my with my friends who are here presenting, it can be a physical building. Um, some of us prior to the pandemic, we all had a research center that we worked at together, and that was like the home base. Um, and when you're navigating like these racially hostile campuses, it's nice to have a location or a group of people, or even now in COVID times, even if that's just a group chat, um, a place that you can sort of go to and be with your people and sort of recharge. Um, it is needed. And I, I feel like my graduate experience would not be um, anywhere near as beneficial if it wasn't, um, if that wasn't the case. And I guess in addition to that, from a structural standpoint to faculty and staff, I, I challenge like, hey, how do you talk about us when we're not there? Um, how do you talk about us to your colleagues? Um, what does that conversation look like? Um, advocating for us in those spaces is equally, if not more important than how you advocate for us directly to our faces in, or in this space um, in our one-on-one -on -one meetings. Um, so those are two things I'd point out. Thank you, Isaiah. Kaylin? I'm gonna give a, like a different answer. I think um, for me, particularly being in COVID and quarantine, like I've really leaned on folks who are not in academia. So like my real community. Um, so whether it's telling my mom, my qualifying exams coming up, like, please ask me if I read this many articles within the week, like a system of loving accountability was really great. Um, and also just like talking to my friends, like nerding out, like trusted friends, like Okay, because for me, it's really important that this work remains grounded in like who I am in my community. And it's cute to like talk theory and like be all intellectual, but like if I can explain this to my mom, it doesn't really matter to me. So I think for me, just staying grounded within like folks within my community who really matter has been really, really crucial for me. And I, I'm really fortunate for my colleague friends on this call, as well as other friends and folks that I have in Rossier. And I could imagine, you know, like, if I had gone elsewhere, I would have felt isolated in a different way. And so I think that like leaning on these different types of support and, and networks is really, really important for us, particularly in this moment. Thank you. Jamon and then Sarah. Yeah, I think for me, um, I want to focus on faculty and what they can do. And I think um, to remind you all of um, Kaylin's last point of listening to Black students. Admittedly, I come from a counseling background. So for me, I implore faculty to reach out, be proactive, ask your students not just how they're doing, but how have their goals changed from your last conversation? How is life outside of academia? Um, <laughs> the world is, is, is pretty wild right now and has been for the, for the past year. So, so last, I guess, just emphasizing that these questions should be coming from a point of curiosity and interest in their well-being and less about not always trying to provide a solution uh, because sometimes that can create a very transactional uh, relationship and may at least i can speak for myself sometimes turn folks off so it is a it is an art um, but I, I do think that the art is rooted in curiosity uh, in one's overall well-being because if we are good as humans then we can be well uh, academically. Mm -hmm. um, everything that my colleague friend said, absolutely, totally agree. I think really the only other thing that I could add is more so specifically a tip for, for students um, and it's to take breaks. 
Um, the work will always be there, but will you is the question. I think that there is this kind of undertone humor that all of us have. We cop on Zoom calls or text or whatever, and we ask each other, hey, how are you? And we always say, well, I'm here. Uh, I'm okay. I'm good. You know, yeah, <laughs> uh, alive. Um, and even though we share that humor, I think that, and this was actually even before the pandemic, we, I think we were still saying the same thing. Um, I think it is something to be said that this can be a very exhausting experience for mm -hmm. any PhD student, regardless of your identity, but take breaks when you need so. And to be very transparent, um, I, I am huge on narrative and huge on sharing uh, personal experiences. So for me, um, I did take about a summer off of my PhD program mm -hmm. to fully recharge, um, to fully take a break and breathe. Um, I had lost my father six weeks before I started my PhD program. And I kind of just kept going and kept going and kept going. And what I realized is that um, I wish I would have positioned myself first and not the PhD and not academia first. Um, it wasn't worth it. But now I know how to really take care of myself and how to really make sure that, um, that you're taking breaks. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's a really good closing uh, point that although we are looking for support from others, we really do need to take care of ourselves. We know what we need, acknowledge that you need a break. It is okay to take a break. It is okay sometimes to feel weak. It's sometimes feeling like you don't wanna continue, but then reach out for that support. I, I wanna read uh, this comment by T. Wells Bryant. Uh, and I think this is uh, really a good quote. I live and breathe the other mothering model for over 20 years. As an academic professional, I have coupled this unique aspect of mentoring, coaching and caring supportive connection with students, black tend to do tend to do overall life, work and school included from a community model, which in many cases is solidified and embedded with a strong matriarch. I am so grateful this ageless approach is now recognized. This conversation is very affirming for me as I have been scrutinized often for this caring approach, which is often miscategorized and misidentified. Yeah, let's care for each other. I really want us to take a moment to thank our presenters from the University of Southern California. This was eye-opening. This reminds us why we have chosen to be educators. Uh, it is to support you, to make sure you thrive, uh, to make sure that you, you can succeed, uh, affirm your excellence, affirm that you can do it. And I know everybody in this call uh, understands that now, if they hadn't understood already, that you're a human being. You're not just a student. <laughs> you are a human being. Uh, Jamon, Sarah, Kaylan, Isaiah, and James, Thank you so very much. And I want to remind everybody that these are PhD students, researchers, they are candidates. Uh, if you are looking for folks to hire in the next one, two or three years, follow them up. They are here. <laughs> uh, if you want to remember who they are, this recording is going to be posted on the Anchor website in five to seven days. You can come back and uh, check out who they are and, and uh, you know, follow them, ask them questions, e uh, invite them to your institutions uh, to support your students or even to give talks. Yes, uh, I really do like supporting students and letting them know Anchor is a great platform for you. Uh, and it's a great platform to connect with other professionals. I wanna remind everybody that uh, we did talk about intersectionality on this call. Uh, Kimberly Crenshaw is going to be a keynote speaker at Anchor 2021. So please plan on registering for Anchor 2021 and uh, team members have put the dates on there. We are only going to be charging you $100 if you're an undergraduate or graduate student. That's the least we have ever charged because we wanna acknowledge everything that's going on. Uh, so please, once we open registration, which probably is going to be early next week, uh, 
you know, uh, register. If you're a team of 10 uh, plus, <laughs> there's gonna be a discount. We are also gonna be opening positions for hosts and moderators, and you can apply to be one. That is gonna score you more discounts. Uh, you can always contact us and call at ou.edu. Finally, I really want to thank you all again. Thank you for joining us from uh, all 50 states, wherever you joined us from. And thank you to our wonderful presenters and PhD students. Uh, thank you so very much uh, for joining us and for such a great presentation. So from the University of Oklahoma, uh, Norman Campus, I'm Dr. Jenny Rongo. Thank you very much. And we'll see you next time.